Kudos to the history-making nation of Iran, the country's president, Hassan Rouhani, tweeted this week. He was welcoming the massive victory for quote-unquote reformist and moderate candidates in the elections to the Iranian parliament and to an influential council of clerics. The election results, said Rouhani, open a new chapter for the Islamic Republic. But do they really? Or are they, as some suggest, just a way of distracting attention from the country's ongoing economic problems and human rights abuses? I'm joined to discuss this by Azar Nafisi, the Iranian writer, academic, dissident, who left Iran for the United States in 1997, and who's author, of course, of the acclaimed memoir, Reading Lolita in Tehran. Azar Nafisi, thanks for joining me on Up Front. Pleasure. Um, these latest Iranian election results and the big victories yeah. for reformists and moderates that they've produced, uh, they filled a lot of people with hope uh, about Iran changing. Have they filled you with hope? Well, I've always had hope. I was never optimistic, but I always had hope for Iran. But I hate um, to act uh, about something this serious as if we're in we're, um, audiences in a football game. Mm. You know, great victory for yeah. patriots. No, it's not like that. It is complicated. One aspect of it is positive, but it was positive when Khatami was elected. The former it president. It was posi positive when in 2009, millions of people came into the streets against Mr. Ahmadinejad. These have been happening before. Mm. Remember all the um, sort of predictions about what Mr. Khatami can do. And now the whole point about Mr. Khatami's time was that during that time there were openings. Mm. Civil society was active. You read those newspapers, mm. you know, um, from dialogue of civilizations to yes. freedom of speech. Okay, so what happened? Today, all those people who were mm, at the forefront of that movement are in jail. Mm. They've, some of them voted from jail. Yeah. And Mr. Rouhani, so the whole idea of civil society and the discourse on opening, political openings, has been diluted. Mm. It is now more focused on economic situation, and the situation of human rights is not even mentioned. You were expelled from the University of Tehran back in 1981 after the revolution for refusing to wear the veil. You left Iran for the United States in 1997. Do you think the human rights situation in Iran today is better or worse than it was when you lived there in the 80s and 90s? Well, I, I mentioned in one of my books that um, living in the Islamic Republic is like the month of April. There's sun and then there's showers. <laughs> you know, you go through these periods of storms and, and, and sun, storm and sun. Um, so um, I see the fact that uh, the laws are still basically the same laws. And a lot of people who were free then are now in jail. Um, there are some freedoms in terms of the way people appear in the, you know, in, in the streets. In terms and, of women in clothing. Uh, women in clothing, which kudos to the women, by the way. Uh, you know, they took that right. They were jailed and um, flogged and, um, uh, you know, uh, humiliated uh, for wearing their weapons of mass destruction, you know. And they would go into jails, they come back into the streets and they will look the same, which is why I say, that the problem of Iran and the interest in Iran and the greatness of Iran is not politics. For Iranian people, for the civil society in Iran, this fight is existential. It is not simply political. For me, uh, the issue of the veil was never whether veil is good or bad. My grandmother wore the veil all her life. She was a fantastic woman an Orthodox Muslim who refused to leave home for three months during Reza Shah's time because they made taking off the bills mandatory. I'm her granddaughter. I refuse to do, to have somebody else impose their interpretation of my religion, of my principles on me. Women, minorities, and culture in Iran have been the main agents of change, which is what we forget in most mm. of our news about Iran. Yeah. So in 2009, the Green Movement that took to the streets, they didn't take to the streets, initially at least, to pull down the system. They took to the streets because they believed their presidential candidate had been robbed of yeah. his presidency. You, I suspect, want to see not just the presidential candidates change, but the whole system. You don't want to, su but, but you don't want a supreme leader no, in that, Iran, that, do you? That, that goes through a lot of steps. That goes through a lot of changes. You know... Well, it's uh, a simple question. I'm just trying to get no, where no, you no, stand. No, that, that's, why, that's why I In an Iran that you I want to live in, would there be any clerical involvement? No, no. no but, and there would be no supreme but, leader, and there would be no... Uh, let me go to another movement. Um, yeah. Let's go to South Africa. 
Mandela wants to see um, the system of, uh, I'm, uh, and I'm not saying that Iran is South Africa, by the way, um, white supremacist um, uh, gone. You go through stages. Yeah. And one thing that I learned from literature, especially from Shahrazad, is that you refuse to go into their domain. Mm. You refuse to use the language that they use. They have called me a whore. They have called me an adulterer. I always call them Mr. Ahmadinejad and Mr. Khamenei because that is the kind of resistance mm. which is going to change Iran radically. So whether an Ayatollah is the president or a secular Marxist is a president, democracy, the multivocality of voices mm. is guaranteed. And some of your critics, both Iranian and Western, though, have questioned your ties uh, to various US conservative, neoconservative mm. figures, Bernard Lewis, Fouad Ajami, Paul Wolfowitz, the kind of people mm. who do want to see uh, regime change in Tehran, even if it involves dropping bombs on Iran. What's your response to critics who say, well, look, you're allied with all these people who want to bomb oh, Iran? Who said I'm allied, first of all? Some of the people who say that, I was much closer with them <laughs> than I was, ever was with any of the people you mentioned. When I left Iran, there were two things that I told myself I will do. One was freedom of association. I will go anywhere and I will talk with anyone, but I will never change my positions. Mm. I would never take Mr. Wolfowitz or um, mm -hmm. Ajami's positions. I, before talking about it in public, Every time I would run into someone whom I knew was pro-war, I would make sure mm. that they know my position. So the point in a democratic way of thinking is that you keep firm on your principles, mm. but you talk with everyone. Because if anybody needs to change, are those who believe that they should bomb Iran. But if these people bring one example, one example of me, talking for the war in Iraq, talking for... I think they point to things like Christopher Hitchens once claimed that the Paul yes. in the acknowledgements of your famous book, Reading Lenin, yeah, and, and, and is it was Paul wrong. It was, and, and, and it was wrong. It's not Paul Wolfowitz. Uh, well, no, he said that I dedicated the book to Paul Wolfowitz. No, but you thank no, in the acknowledgements of Paul, no, and many people say it's Paul Wolfowitz no, who, no, who, well, get pe well, who gets see, people worked see, up. I don't want to respond to questions when I say Paul, and somebody comes and wants to accuse me of being neoconservative. Well, to be fair, Christopher Hitchens is the one who raised it, and he's on your side of the argument. I don't think he was accusing you of anything. Just one final question before we finish. What would be your advice uh, to outsiders, Western governments in particular, who are looking at these Iranian election results and thinking, now is the time to embrace Iran, bring Iran in from the cold culturally, academically, diplomatically, economically? What is your advice to such people? Well, I think that uh, Iran should, uh, should open to the world, and, and anyone who is uh, in a position to help with that opening should, should, should help with it. What I don't want to see is to have parts of Iran shown uh, to merely give the credit to the regime and the other parts not shown. Treat us the way you treat yourself. What I'm trying to tell them is that Sarah Palin, Hillary Clinton, and Michelle Obama all claim to be Christian who is more Christian than the other? Give us the same credit as, as people who come from those countries. We are various and we are, want the same things. Azana Fisi, thanks for joining me on Upfront. To continue this discussion on the Iranian elections, I'm now joined from New York by Iranian-American journalist and commentator Negar Murtazavi, who's been following these results closely. Uh, Negar, thanks for joining me on Upfront. Are we getting too excited for having by me. these election results in Iran? Do they really matter that much? Uh, Azar Nafisi was suggesting that it may not be uh, the great opening we want it to be. I think the Iranian people are pretty excited, but we shouldn't forget that this is not the super liberal or the top of the reformist movement even within the Iranian political structure that won. Many of the prominent reformist candidates were disqualified by the Guardian Council before the election. So they had to pull up a coalition of moderates, of reformists, even some conservatives who are closer to the center to be able to pull this off. But th at the end of the day, 
uh, the way people see it is that the reformists were able to win with tied hands, and I think that's a very big win for them. You say big win. Ultimately, the critics would say Iran isn't a democracy. It's a theocracy with a supreme leader uh, who gets the final say over everything that matters, hence the name supreme leader. Uh, so it's a mistake for outsiders to spend so much time poring over these election results for a parliament which doesn't have much power. I actually don't see it as that black and white. At the end of the day, the assembly of experts that the Iranians voted for, technically on paper, according to the Constitution, is the body that is supposed to appoint and even oversee um, the supreme leader, as you may, or the leader of Iran. Um, on foreign policy, for example, where Iran uh, often is in the news headlines globally, it's been heavily criticized for things like supporting Bashar al-Assad in Syria. These elections aren't going to change any of that, are they? Let's not forget the role of the previous parliament, which was dominated by the conservatives or the hardliners, in causing all kinds of hiccups to the foreign policy um, path that President Rouhani has taken throughout his negotiations uh, with the world powers, throughout um, his, his process of making the nuclear deal. The parliament was able to um, cause basically a lot of what I call hiccups. They couldn't sabotage the entire deal, but they just made it very difficult for the administration to go on. I think the nuclear deal was the major gain of President Rouhani. It was um, one of his main promises of his election campaign, and he was able to deliver, which was something that people were looking forward to. It wasn't just a nuclear deal. It means the lifting of sanctions. It means an economic uh, boost for, for Iran, uh, which has a staggering economy. There's a high unemployment rate. So that was something that the majority of the population was looking forward, and the president was able to deliver. So the parliament, his coalition or his allies, in the parliament also ran um, on that platform and that definitely gave them um, a lot of power to win the electorate. So can this new parliament uh, improve the human rights situation on the ground inside of Iran even under President Rouhani who is uh, deemed to be a pragmatist, a moderate, the guy who did the nuclear deal uh, under his presidency in 2015 I believe the number of executions in Iran went up not down. Definitely. So the human rights situation, especially when it comes to executions, the political prisoners, like I said, the house arrest of top leaders of the opposition, that's something that the president hasn't been able uh, to really tackle. Again, let's not forget that the judiciary, the court system, the prison system, that's something that's still being dominated by the hardliners. This um, parliament will not be able to change much of that because they don't have too much power over the judiciary. But again, the, the parliament and the administration are two important pillars of power. So if both sides are in the hands of the moderates, at least um, they, they can be able to work together and form a coalition and there will be a stronger um, power against the hardliners or the judiciary system. But um, still, I think that will be a slow process. Negar Mortazavi, we'll have to leave it there. Thanks for joining me on Upfront. That's our show. Upfront will be back next week.